Hey friends, welcome back to this garden tour series that I'm doing in which I walk you through different parts of the garden and offer you a little bit more detail than you often get in these videos. And I'm able to do that by, you know, focusing on some areas. And so today we're going to focus on sort of the the rest of what's left on, I would say, the part of the gardens that I consider to be those that surround the house the most. So these are the gardens that feature more annuals, more color, um, just honestly more work than other parts of the garden. Because generally the way my yard is laid out is that the, the areas that are closest to the house um, tend to be more colorful. I use more annuals. Um, I'm really focused on the summertime show for these and those areas that are farther from the house get a little bit more natural, um, have perhaps more all season interest because I look at those from outside the windows instead of sitting in them. So today we're going to work on uh, the circle garden behind me, the front patio border and the garden on the west side which is just kind of a, a, a small little garden that that won't take long to get through as well as a few of the containers that are on the uh, on the front patio here so let's start here with the circle garden so we just had a big rainstorm come through i don't know maybe two hours ago so things are laying over a little bit here this morning um, but honestly everything's been kind of listing this way anyways because uh, it's just the wind's been blowing from the west a lot so everything's been laying that direction um, so this circle garden which is not a circle was the original vegetable garden when we moved into this house 21 years ago it was derelict at that point and basically had weeds and a few other things in it in 2009, I made this into a vegetable garden. I made it into the oval that you see here, and I made it, I had three sort of curvy paths in it, and I made it into a vegetable garden. In 2017, I renovated this to be more of a formal space. So let me see if I can actually get the camera up for you so you can kind of see this a little bit better. I have four, um, so I have four paths coming out of this in sort of an X shape. A circular garden in the middle the entire thing is aligned with a chive hedge this is a quirky little thing that I do I started with a couple of chive plants I divided them over several years and planted every segment is outlined in chives um, I just think it's kind of an interesting play on a like a formal parterre type garden where you might have a boxwood hedge why not do chives so each section is planted individually. There are two because it's an oval. The two sections at the end are a little bit bigger. So each of those is divided into three sections. There is a boxwood in a pot in the center of each section. So this year on these smaller side beds, I planted these um, loosely but with all the same thing rather than trying to divide them so in this case uh, i just did a whole bunch of very colorful dahlias in here um, like that is melody pink allegro which is a really nice shorter dahlia we've got some uh, Crichton honeys in here actually many Crichton honeys in here um, this one is maybe hamari gold um, with a Japanese beetle and which has just been a feature of all my tours. Oh, and there's like a um, first date back there. This sort of, this is, this is a relative of, oh no, this is, I believe this is HS single, HS first love, HS first love. This is sort of a peachier version of HS first date with the dark foliage. Um, all those blooms were great yesterday. That's the thing with these single dahlias. Um, they will keep blooming like crazy. They look good, but the blooms don't last for many days and you keep have to keep up on the deadheading, which I love. I love deadheading dahlias. It's, one, I, it's just one of those garden jobs that I enjoy doing. Um, as we come around to this next segment, now this segment is obviously in sun right now, but it's of all of these segments, this gets the least total sun throughout the day. So we've got several Bobo hydrangeas. Now I moved some of these around this year and uh, because I didn't like the spacing on them. And what's really interesting is the ones that didn't get moved, like the one at the front, are in full bloom. The ones that were moved are, you know, several weeks behind. They're gonna flower just fine. It's just that the flowers are behind because I moved those around. 
Uh, down here we have, this is a, a new, a new begonia for next year, although I did see it in stores this year too. This is uh, from Proven Winners. It's Surefire Cherry Cordial, and it is a workhorse in the garden. First of all, I mean, obviously, really beautiful, shiny foliage, so can't go wrong there. It's a very, um, I would describe this as a very pinky red. It's kind of scarlet. I would call this a scarlet color. So I feel like that plays pretty well with the rest of my garden. And it has needed very little. In fact, I planted um, Euphorbia Diamond Frost in amongst it, which was a waste because it's all lost in there. Um, I think there are eight or nine plants in this area. Um, can't say enough about the performance on that one. Back here I have Itea Fizzy Mizzy, newly planted this year from quite small plants. Um, now, I wanted to try Itea. I have been told by a lot of people in this area that they don't have good luck of overwintering it. So we'll see how this goes. Um, the goal here is that these will all fill in and have a nice little, um, have a nice little flowering period on them. It's nice to not have everything in this garden be a high maintenance annual. For this segment, I went with all seed grown annuals, almost like a mini cutting garden, although I haven't been cutting anything from it because I think it looks so pretty. So I put in zinnias and nicotiana and marigolds and cosmos, and I think there's a couple of straw flowers in here. And I sort of like the informality of this area. I actually think this whole circle garden planted like this would be really quite stunning. I don't know that I would do that at this point, but I think it's a pretty good look. Um, a couple of zinnias, I, I think these are pretty, someone told me they like their zinnias a little brighter than this, but these are from uh, Dawn Creek's seed sale. But we have, I couldn't even tell you all the different zinnias in here because I grew several different varieties in here. Um, and I'm always a big fan of the lime green ones. I think this is Benary's Giant Lime. Not, I don't believe this is Green Envy, but all the lime zinnias are, I mean, I, lime zinnias for life as far as I'm concerned. And I think this is um, Apricot Lemonade cosmos here there's one of them over there there's a white one i think that's sonata white back there i think this is ruben rubinetto cosmos so some really pretty cosmos in there you know the whole situation is like leaning a little bit and i don't really mind it's all quite informal in this last section here i always grow my rhubarb here I think rhubarb is a beautiful plant. It does get a little tattered looking and rough looking later in the season, uh, but that's okay with me. I think it provides enough interest throughout the rest of the summer, and I like rhubarb. Uh, so this area has really flopped badly, which is too bad because this is a really good combination. This is um, unplugged so blue salvia, which is my preferred proven winter salvia because it doesn't get as wild and crazy as that Rockin' series, which I feel is way too big for most applications. And then I've put in some, which is all kind of flopped because of the rain here, uh, Mercardonia gold dust through there. So we've got the yellow and the blue. And if these were standing up, I think you would like this much more, but they are definitely listing. And then in this last segment here, uh, this is the area where I took out the roses last year and I planted Midnight Sun Wygela. I had three of them in here that were not like the others. I moved those and bought new ones. Those were Midnight Sun. They turned out to be Midnight Sun. Um, so I could have kept them, but that's fine. They're in another part of the garden. So that's what Midnight Sun looks like. The goal here is for this area to only be Midnight Sun uh, in the future. I planted the Gara this year just to fill in the holes because these were brand new shrubs that were quite small. I happen to think the color on these is really gorgeous. I think this will be very pretty, um, particularly when it's just these planted in this area. And then the center of the circle garden is primarily um, three different kinds of clematis, most of which have done have gone through their bloom cycle. I believe this is Star River. It is a really pretty one, and I, this is a rebloom on that. Um, you know, I really like 
the seed heads on clematis. I think they're quite pretty. So while you can sometimes encourage more rebloom by cutting off the seed heads, I'm reluctant to do that because I think this is equally pretty. And in the bottom here, I've just got some uh, lobularia planted, which is just, um, it's actually a little bit out of flower right now. They cycle in and out of flower, but should come back with a vengeance, I think, here soon. Before we go around the corner, I just want to talk to you about this west bed. This west bed is probably, at least in terms of shape and size, the closest to what was here when we moved into this house. I've changed most everything in it, um, but I've never really changed the shape of it or the size of it. Um, it's a tough bed because it's west facing, but we have so many trees on the property that it doesn't get as much sun as you would think. And so it's one of those things where it does get a few shots of really intense sun. It's a little tricky to grow in. And uh, last year or the year before, I went through and really simplified the planting and I'm gonna redo things again, but I'll just show you sort of the main features. So first of all, this is, uh, you know, the classic wine and roses, Wygela. I planted this eons ago. It blocks the, um, the meter, the utility meter is behind that. So it does a great job of that. It blooms well here, looks great. Over here, I've got two peonies. These are old fashioned peonies. These are the only plants other than trees that exist on this property that were here when we got here. Peonies, of course, live a very long time. Um, I just let them, they're just a light pink, fluffy variety. I don't think they're anything special, but I feel a bit of a sense of duty to leave them here. Like something should be left in this garden, you know, that was here when I got here. So a few years ago, I came through here and replanted everything in the ground other than those peonies and the Wygela and then the other shrubs that we're going to talk about with Calamintha Montrose White, which is in flower now. And that's all these frilly little guys along here. Uh, Sanguisorba right here, which is not yet flowering. And this Big Beauty Allium. Big Beauty Allium is very pretty, has really beautiful blue strappy foliage but the flowers are a big disappointment to me. I didn't realize when I planted that big beauty that the flowers are gonna be quite so pale. Uh, so I'm gonna go through here and I'll probably leave the big beauty or replant it somewhere else because it's still a beautiful plant. But I am gonna go in here and swap this out probably for either Millennium or Windy City Allium because that combination with the Calamintha is a really primo combination. But I do wanna keep this garden simple in terms of plant palette, because um, it's just a small garden. And one thing I've noticed over the years is like, if it's a small garden, just pick like three plants and a few foundation pieces and go with it because anything else gets mishmashy. I still think it's a little bit mishmashy, um, but we're on our way to cleaning that up. The espalier that you see here was the first one they planted. It is an Asian pear. I do not know which one, and I actually have three or four fruits on it this year, which is exciting. There is a tier that's the first tier down there. Now the second tier lost its lateral branches and I am trying to get those to regenerate and grow back out again, but it's tough because we still have one more tier to go. So it's, you know, this is apical dominance, which is where all the energy goes into growing up. So you can see I've topped, let me try to get you closer to this. So you can see that I've topped that top branch there and that will be, what I believe will be the final um, tier here. So we'll let this go one more. And then after that, I'm just going to top it because at some point it's going to get wild and crazy and, you know, ladders will be involved for everything. So um, still, it's a very beautiful plant. And, uh, and I like it even though this one tier is, you know, a little ridiculous looking. That's what happens sometimes, right? In front of that, we have some very tall, tough stuff hydrangeas four feet probably, certainly three, all of three and a half, but I think that top stem is four feet. Um, did not bloom super well this year. They got pretty badly eaten by deer last year. I usually get some fencing around these to protect them. And these should bloom on old wood too, but I've not seen that happening here this year. Um, I actually, in terms of flower shape, I actually prefer tough stuff to tiny tough stuff, which has like a double flower. Um, but that 
but tiny tough stuff bloom much better for me this year you can see all these leaflets coming in here it's really quite interesting to look at this plant now because this plant is getting tall i am going to prune it here shortly this will be my prune so that there's still time for it to develop flower buds for winter we're getting right to the time where if you're going to do that um, serratas are very similar to um, uh, macrophylla type hydrangeas in terms of blooming on old wood and new wood so I'm gonna prune this um, to bring the size down a little bit because it's a little taller than I would like and honestly than it should be and um, then hopefully we'll get a good bloom next year there is still a ligularia stuck in here I should take this out it has no business being here and I have ligularia all in other places where it would certainly work this area on the corner is all Annabelle's. You can probably tell because they've flopped quite a bit. I do have some supports underneath them. So there's so much talk about flopping Annabelle's. In fact, I was talking to another gardener about it last night and we just said, everyone knows that Annabelle's flop. And I don't think that makes it a bad plant. It doesn't really bother me. I still think it's beautiful, even though it would be prettier if it was standing up straight. Um, I prefer Annabelle's these days to Incrediballs. Incrediballs supposedly have stiffer stems, although they flop for me just as badly in some areas. Um, but Annabelle's have big flowers, but Incrediballs have ridiculous flowers to the point where I feel like it's actually distracting. They're so big. So I like the flower size of animals. I like how green they stay. I think they're really pretty all year. This is one of the first plants that I planted in this garden. And this was one Annabelle hydrangea. And of course, uh, hydrangeas where will root them, lay their branches down and then root themselves. So this has kind of turned into a colony behind me here. Uh, the pink hydrangea that you see here, here's one of the blooms. Some of the blooms have turned kind of an unpleasant color there. And there's one good pink one back there. Um, this is either uh, Invincible Spirit or Invincible Spirit 2. I have both. The other one is um, actually out of color. So I don't know which one is which, to be honest. Um, honestly, I never noticed a whole lot of difference. Invincible Spirit 2 was supposed to be a, an improved version of Invincible Spirit. And honestly, I don't notice much difference. I do think this particular flower, which has like a little bit of cream in it and a little bit of lime and a little bit of pink, I actually think that's a pretty gorgeous, pretty gorge, gorgeous flower there. So that's this side garden. Um, again, the idea here is a little bit of a limited palette. I love, I still like the hydrangeas, even though they're a little flat. I'm okay with all of that. Okay, let's move around here to the front again. So uh, the white spire birches that are planted in these pots are on year two. They're very hardy trees. So last year we overwintered these outside. I just actually put Christmas lights on them, moved them onto the patio. They were really pretty, but they need to get out of these pots. They are very unhappy. The roots are coming up to the surface. So these will be taken out of these pots and planted somewhere uh, this fall. I really think they're beautiful. I think that the vertical accent helps bring kind of a tall house into a little bit better proportion. And this year I wasn't even able to underplant them with anything because the roots are just so jammed in there. Um, ignore the really attractive wasp trap. We have a real, we got a real problem with wasps happening here. Um, over here. Now we're going from sun to shade here, so sorry about that. So this is the big planter. This is this planter um, from Country Casual Teak. It's 36 by 36 by 36. It is like my dream container. I wish all containers were that big. Uh, so this year we went with the um, Bird of Paradise in here. This is the Bird of Paradise that I had planted last year in the urn. I overwintered it as a house plant. And like a lot of these tropical plants, it's been a little late getting going this year. So I've still had this sort of V shape because it has not filled in. We've got two new leaves in here now, which are really nice and starting to make this look good. I'm just a little disappointed that this didn't happen sooner in the year. Then I planted, you may recall this, this is uh, Colocasia uh, Royal Hawaiian Waikiki. 
and uh, it's just now coming into really good color and really good size and I like this in this um, certainly you could plant that as a centerpiece and I did in a couple other containers but I like it as sort of a large foliage accent um, to bring the height down a little bit. I always feel the need to do something very tall in this container. Again, um, because the stairs are so tall on the house, I just feel like we need to get some height to make things make sense. And then I filled this in with a variety of things, including um, this is Queen Tut Papyrus. That's new this year. This is, um, I better put the name on the screen because I don't want to get it wrong, but this is a new Superbina for next year. It is huge and almost a little aggressive. Very pretty, but, but plant this one with some room to spare. We've got um, Angelonia back here. Uh, this is, well, I told you it just rained, so there, everything is not looking great, but this is the new Supertunia, um, the mini. I like the mini Vistas, they're quite nice. And then around here, um, we've got some really pretty um, sweet potato vine, which I think references the purple that we see elsewhere in here. And then, of course, I put some Secretia Purple Heart in here as well. Um, I don't like this container as much as I liked it last year, but as it keeps growing, it is getting better and better. Um, I just think that Colocasia is like a big winner for sure. I think probably, you know, I put this, this super bean in here because um, it was sent to me as a trial plant and I wanted to kind of really give it a go. This would, this container would be far more effective if I had gone with a brighter colored uh, super bean in here. This is what's left of, I believe this is Betty Corning. Uh, Clematis comes up from behind here. Such a pretty little, little one here always like that uh, things I've got my mint in a pot always a mint in a pot this is um, again it's all sort of floppy but uh, this is super bells double vintage coral it is I have not cut this back obviously it has been blooming so well I didn't want to sacrifice any of the blooms so it's doing very good at the ends it's a little sparse on top but highly recommend this one it is it's really good so now we're going to work our way across the front here and that starts with the columnar apples one of the two columnar apples that i planted has a beautiful apple on it and i'm very excited to try it that one is scarlet sentinel so i'm very excited to try to try that i just put um a few little ground covers in there to spruce up those pots so the dahlia show it is late this year and struggling and i think i have tarnish bugs because i'm getting a lot of malformed flowers and uh, tarnish bugs are kind of hard to manage um, i'm hoping things shake out a little bit here but normally by this time of the year all of these would be like in absolute full bloom and we've not seen that happen yet there's some intermittent including uh, Clearview peach fuzz which is well named and a very fun little dahlia um, that's cafe au lait right there this is uh, Thomas Edison which should be much bigger than what you see there so I wouldn't say we're having a great dahlia year but we are having a pretty good year for the front border let me start over here because it's probably easier to see from this angle of the sun. So again, this is one of those things where we work with repetition. And I did walk you through this when I planted it, but I will just show you quickly. So this is the new Surefire White Begonia. There are three planted in each of these clumps. Two would have been fine. I actually find myself going in here and pruning out stems quite a bit to make sure it doesn't take over everything else. Feather Falls Carex, which is a perennial actually. Um, this is the Super Angelonia, Super Blue, uh, flopping a bit. I don't know, you guys. The Angelonia is... love the idea of Angelonia. I'm not finding the performance in terms of staying upright and continuing to bloom. I'm, I'm not fully satisfied with that. Uh, we've got, of course, more of this Secretia in the front here. We've got dotted throughout here more of this uh, queen tut papyrus grass 
uh, new for next year or new for this year, I'm not sure, from Proven Winners. Very high marks. Love this plant. Very manageable size. Much nicer habit to me than all of the other papyrus grasses in the uh, Proven Winners line. And I just think it is a great textural accent here. There is a rose here. It's above and beyond. It's new this year. It looks terrible. Absolutely wretched. Been decimated by Japanese beetles and sawfly larvae and all bad things. Um, I do have some, although it's really getting eaten up here, I do have some peachy keen superbina tucked throughout here. It, I wish it, it had done a little bit better here. It's just getting eaten here. I think it's getting probably too much water. They just don't love to be constantly wet. I did put in this new little super tuna vis, super tunia vista yellow, if that's the name of it, through here. That is a good plant and that is holding up. There's only three of them in here. I just kind of dotted them in as a little accent. That one's doing the best. Um, I think they'll really get, get truck in here actually in a little bit. Here's the w update on the window box. When I planted this originally, I had little stakes to put um, some Lafos in there. Acerina or Lafos, wine red. One of them, the one on this side died. I tried to replant it with a different one that had self-seeded. It didn't work. So because I only had one growing, I just took the supports out and I'm letting that grow, which you can, letting that grow as a trailer. So it, it doesn't have a lot of impact, but I just, it looked awkward to me having it uneven. So the other plants in there, this is where the um, peachy keen superbina is actually doing fabulous. Uh, in the back, we've got Euphorbia Escot Rainbow. We've got some of the um, Angelonia. Again, not standing up. I should, you know, I love the purple color in there, but it was supposed to be standing up and it's bothering me that's not, and I don't feel like I should have to stake that. Uh, this is um, the Samachia Waikiki Sunset. And then we've got more of the Purple Heart there. I've been pruning on the Purple Heart quite a bit. It is a pretty aggressive plant. So I've been pruning on that quite a bit to make sure it doesn't uh, kind of overtake the whole thing. I think if that Angelonia was standing up, that would be a primo window box. I'm still pretty happy with it, by the way. Oh, here's a Penn Hill Watermelon Dahlia. Always in my top five, in particular when it comes to the dinner plate size dahlias. Here's the other columnar apple. And then we have more dahlias down here. I will say this dahlia that's tucked in here is Penn Hill watermelon and it's fading. But I don't know if you can appreciate the size of that flower. It's huge. Always with the Penn Hill watermelons, the first ones that bloom are the biggest. So we've got more dahlias in here. These sweet peas are hanging on for dear life and God bless them for it because they're still looking great. This is one of the latest I've ever had sweet peas. It's fairly shocking, but I really love them in this area. I love them by the door. You get a little whiff of sweet peas when you walk by. This, uh, this little trough planter, I always do edibles in it because I like the basil and the parsley right outside the door. I've got a couple of tomatoes in there. And then this is where I planted my kitchen minis peppers. Here's where are we at here. Got a couple of peppers on that right there. A couple of peppers right there. I got to pick some peppers. I think next year I'm not going to do exclusively edibles in here. I think I'm going to mix edibles and, um, more color in here. It's still pretty. Uh, it's just not as pretty as I think it should be for right here. And then we'll just quickly go up on the deck so I can show you those containers. So I'm really happy with these containers. I know they look a little lopsided because we've got the lime time coleus really creating the height. I I'm totally fine with that, especially since you know, we walk on this side. So lime thyme coleus, um, I'll have to get you the name of that. This is a new sample um, 
name on the screen, you guys. I'm sorry. Um, it's called Ballerina. It hasn't grown much. It's really pretty. It hasn't grown much. I love the little gold dust, so here it is again. And then this is the um, purple bell vine finally getting going. Sometimes this one is such a stinker in terms of getting going. Um, very pretty, I think. We repeat that pot over here. And then this is mostly where house plants live in this corner. This is my big ficus tree, which thankfully has really liked it outside. Thank God for being able to come outside in summer. Otherwise this ficus would just, it'd be dead. So um, it's got a lot of new growth on it. I picked up this Rex begonia when I did my big truckload of the big great plant sale I was at. So I planted that there. I will bring that in. And then I've got a couple of, these are pelargoniums. Um, this one was a gift from someone. This one is kind of a fun one that I picked up somewhere along the line. Uh, those are finally looking good too. And then I have another little cluster of pots over here. Uh, if you have been around for a while, you might remember that a couple of years ago, I planted this uh, Senecio skyscraper. And uh, that plant got a little, I brought it in every year. It got a little rough over winter. So I took cuttings and planted the cuttings. And these are the cuttings uh, planted in spring. Uh, we've got foxtail fern there, and then this is um, this is a new coleus, uh, very aggressive. I just... And this is in the last video I showed you the Aurelia silver umbrella, and this is the Aurelia silver umbrella as viewed from on top of the deck. Now we do have to pull the grill out now to use it, uh, and I do prune on it a little bit because it does. It is coming in a little bit more than I would like it, but as you can tell, it is, it's just perfect for up here on the deck. It feels like you're up in the plants and I love it. Oh, and there is the um, staghorn fern. That's where it lives in summer. Okay, so that is the next part of our series of walking through all these parts of the garden. Like I said, this is the third video that we've done here. I will link the other two below in case you've missed the other two that we've put up so far. But this sort of concludes the the part closest to the house. And these are the heavily gardened areas uh, that require almost daily maintenance in terms of deadheading or watering or things like that. But these are the things that um, we live amongst in summer. All right, I hope you're having a great day in your garden. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more tours coming up soon.